The word holy is firmly embedded in our Western consciousness with certain connotations. We think we know what it means, but most of us never stop to think where our idea of the meaning of holiness came from and whether it's consistent. The standard understanding of God's holiness is usually described as separation, transcendence, or infinite purity. But does it really mean that when we are talking about God? And how have people typically translated the word holy in other countries? We're going to go deep together into answering these questions and more. This is Working for the Word. I'm Andrew Case. Let's get started. Before we get into everything, I want to just say that there's a certain presupposition I'm coming to the table with, and that is that God does not arbitrarily choose names for himself. So I'm assuming that he has revealed himself in certain ways, at certain times, within certain contexts, for a reason. He's unveiling himself with different titles as appropriate. So within the long list of names for God, that we find in the Bible, there are several containing the adjective holy. And this is also applied to all three persons of the Godhead at different times. So if we start with the Old Testament, we see the Holy One of Israel occurs 31 times, almost exclusively in Isaiah, the Holy One of Israel. You can also see 2 Kings 19.22. It occurs in Psalms various times and also in Jeremiah. Now, less frequently, we find the Son referred to as the Holy One of God, once by demons in Mark 1.24, and once by the Twelve in John 6.68. Finally, most well known is the Spirit's title, right? So, we have the Holy Spirit 93 times, the vast majority occurring within the New Testament. And we've got a couple exceptions Isaiah 63.10 and 11 and Psalm 51.11. Now, if you've studied Christian history, then you'll know that this past century has seen an incredible explosion of interest in the Holy Spirit. So, we have to ask ourselves, do we actually understand why the Spirit is called holy? Why is he called the Holy Spirit? Why not the righteous Spirit? Why not the powerful Spirit? Or the loving spirit, you know, that's one of the most popular attributes of God. God is love. So, why not the loving spirit or the good spirit? Out of all the attributes of God, why is holy chosen for the spirit's primary title? Have you ever thought about that? And what does it imply for the waves of the charismatic movements sweeping across the globe today and in other parts of history? So, we're going to tackle these kinds of questions and then try to apply our conclusions to the task of Bible translation in this podcast. So, to start out, for a long time, there has been considerable confusion regarding the meaning of the word holy. So, for the limited scope of this podcast, we'll focus on this confusion and its development within the English-speaking world which has a tendency towards widespread influence in other countries. Now, the word for holy in English can be traced back at least to the 11th century, although there is evidence of its use in Old Norse around 825 AD. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary describes the use of holy as applied to deities in this way. Here we go. The development of meaning has probably been held in religious regard or veneration, kept reverently sacred from human profanation or defilement, hence of a character that evokes human veneration and reverence, and thus in Christian use, free from all contamination of sin and evil, morally and spiritually perfect and unsullied, possessing the infinite moral perfection which Christianity 
attributes to the divine character. End quote. So this infinite moral perfection, quote unquote, persists as an understood meaning by many in the English speaking world today. Others would gloss this as purity or cleanness. And the effects of this interpretation can be seen in residual missionary influence in different parts of the world. So these effects manifest themselves in people groups who have long-standing traditions of referring to the Holy Spirit as the clean spirit or the pure spirit. And subsequently, their idea of what it means for God to be holy remains limited by a concept of high sinlessness or perfection. So after years of this mentality embedding itself into a culture's fabric, it turns out to be extremely difficult to translate the Bible into their language using any terminology that might differ from the ingrained tradition handed down to them by missionaries who had a faulty understanding of the word holy. Now, one of the purposes of this podcast is to offer persuasive biblical evidence that translations and traditions like those mentioned are mistaken and unhelpful. Now, the persistence of this confusion around the word holy in our present day stems from various factors. So, let's talk about two of those. First, English translations of the Bible have insisted on retaining the word holy, even though few modern people intuitively understand the meaning of the term. Now, this phenomenon is similar to the use of the word hosts in phrases like the Lord of hosts or heavenly hosts, which most modern people do not know refers to armies. Within much of the English-speaking church, there's an assumption that Christians understand the word holy, yet at the same time, authors continue to write books to help explain the term, right? We've all seen those books. They're everywhere. Now, these varied explanations have contributed to a a conceptual muddiness, which is related to the second primary factor, the promotion and proliferation of an etymological fallacy. Okay, so that's factor number two, the promotion and proliferation of an etymological fallacy. Now, if you want a good in-depth discussion of what an etymological fallacy is, and some examples of others, you can check out D.A. Carson's excellent book called Exegetical Fallacies, published in 1996. So, uh, yeah, check that out. It's an important book, but you'll get an idea. If you've never heard of this term, you'll get an idea throughout the podcast of what we're talking about. So, this etymological fallacy's roots can be traced back to the influence of W.W. Baudissin. Now, he published a work back in 1878 called The Concept of Holiness in the Old Testament. And in his work, he proposed that the Hebrew kadash, the root kadash, originally came from kad, which meant to cut. Now, you have to understand that back in 1878, we had very, very little information to go off of in terms of related languages to ancient Hebrew. And so, there was limited archaeological evidence to go off of and other things. So, what he was basing this conclusion off of was very sparse evidence, okay? Now, this led to the widespread notion that the primary or essential meaning of holy is apart or separate. Okay, so once again, he said it came from kad, which meant to cut, and now that led to holy meaning apart or separate. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard this definition of holy, without question, without exception. And I'll also say that this has been the standard definition for centuries among the Jews as well. Uh, I was actually in Jerusalem back in 2017, and I I asked a professional scribe I was talking to, a professional Hebrew scribe, what what does holy mean? And immediately, um, this is a guy who's spent thousands of hours copying portions of scripture, and without hesitation, he told me that holy meant separate. 
So this meaning of holy has been further engrafted into the culture and tradition of evangelicals by influential authors and speakers like R.C. Sproul. So his book, The Holiness of God, which has sold more than 200,000 copies since it was first released in the 1980s. So this is a big book, very influential, especially among conservatives, reformed groups. It tends to be a staple volume on every pastor's shelf, and it became immensely popular in a video series that he did. Now, in it, he writes, the primary meaning of holy is separate. There you go. It comes from an ancient word meaning to cut or to separate. To translate this basic meaning into contemporary language would be to use the phrase, quote-unquote, a cut apart. God's holiness is more than just separateness. His holiness is also transcendent. When we speak of the transcendence of God, we are talking about that sense in which God is above and beyond us. Transcendence describes his supreme and absolute greatness. Transcendence describes God in his consuming majesty, his exalted loftiness. It points to the infinite distance that separates him from every creature. End quote. Now, J.I. Packer also contributed to the spread of this idea in his book, Rediscovering Holiness. He writes, Holy, in both biblical languages means separated and set apart for God, consecrated and made over to him, end quote. Then we have a widely influential author, A.W. Tozer, who also offers a definition. He said, what does this word holiness really mean? Holiness in the Bible means moral wholeness a positive quality which actually includes kindness, mercy, purity, moral blamelessness, and godliness. It is always to be thought of in a positive, white intensity of degree. End quote. So, after hearing all of these definitions from famous authors, influential men of God who we all love, You can imagine the average Christian trying to juggle this hazy collection of abstractions. So we've got infinite moral purity and wholeness, kindness, mercy, blamelessness, godliness, transcendence, exalted loftiness, and separateness. So trying to apply such a vast definition to one's reading of Scripture can be baffling. And it is. Now, where do we go from here? Well, let's talk about a guy named Claude Bernard Costacalde, okay, or Costacalde. He's a French evangelical scholar who did some exhaustive research published back in 1986. Now, because his work was published and basically buried, and because it's in French, most influential scholars, especially popular scholars like R.C. Sproul, never read it, never saw it probably. And it's also relatively recent, right? It doesn't have hundreds of years of traction. So I'll tell you a little bit of the story of how I got a hold of this book and how I was able to read it. Uh, Big shout out to my friend, Joel Bell. He is a PhD candidate at Oxford. And so I reached out to him because I was down in Equatorial Guinea where there are no libraries, right? So I said, hey, can you track down this book in the Oxford Library? and scan it for me. And so I can't remember if he bought it online somewhere, tracked it down, or if he got it in the library, but he graciously did that for me and sent me the PDF. So just by the way, we have no excuse nowadays with the riches of technology at our disposal to ignore good books written in other languages because of Google. So I basically did an OCR, optical uh, text recognition, on the whole document so that I could then pipe it through Google Translate. Because I only learned enough French to go to the market in Cameroon, but nothing beyond that. So believe it or not, I was able to understand enough of it to get some of the main points. Now, of course, it wasn't a perfect scan, and Google isn't always perfect, 
But it was definitely way more than enough to get the most salient ideas out of the book. Now, here's basically what this guy did, Costa He studied and examined all of the occurrences in the Old Testament of this root, Kadash, and also in ancient Near Eastern literature of the same time. So, for example, Akkadian and Ugaritic. And not surprisingly, he discovered that the biblical meaning was similar to that in the languages of the culture surrounding Israel. The basic meaning is not separate, but rather consecrated to or devoted to. So basically, Costa Calda criticized Baudissin's study, and he said, look, this guy not only didn't have enough evidence to go off of, but he came up with an etymological fallacy. So etymology is getting back to the original root or meaning of a word historically. And so let's say we have a, a word like butterfly. Well, if we take it apart in English, we can divide it into butter and fly. Does that mean that now, because we've done that, we can better understand what a butterfly is? That it has to do with butter and flies? No, that, that would be an etymological fallacy. Just as much as if somebody today said, I want to understand the word gay. How do people use gay in 2021? So they go back to read Uncle Tom's Cabin and other books from the 1800s, and they conclude that, well, this is a more ancient, you know, we're getting back to the ancient roots of this word, and so obviously this word means happy. So Costa Calda did extremely exhaustive, detailed work in his book on getting to the bottom of this idea of holiness. And first, he spent a lot of time looking at this root's use in Mesopotamia. So what kind of languages are we looking at in Mesopotamia? We're looking at ancient Akkadian, ancient Babylonian, Old Assyrian, Middle Assyrian, Middle Babylonian, Neo-Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian, and Recent Babylonian. And he not only looked at these, but he put all of the evidence in lists and charts and everything for you in the book to analyze with your own eyes. Amazing, amazing information. Now, I will spare you the reading of all of that, and I will jump to the conclusion. So he says, At the end of this study of the derivatives of this root in Mesopotamia, we find that their use makes no allusion to the idea of separation, but rather to that of consecration. The use of the root is certainly reserved for the religious field, but the examination of the texts shows that an object or place or a person dedicated to divinity are called Kadash, mainly because they belong to this divinity. They are not necessarily separate from the everyday social domain. The fact alone that such people can marry and that they play a social role proves it, Thus, all its positive character is preserved. Now, is it the same with the use of the derivatives of Ugaritic? And so, we move on to his chapter 3, which analyzes all the derivatives of Kadosh or Kadash in Ugaritic. So, what does he find after his review of all the available Ugaritic texts? He says, we find that the root derivatives of Kadash are still used in a ritual or mythological religious context. He continues, Kadash belongs to religious vocabulary. We note a singular constant. Everyone referred to as holy is close to El or to Baal or other deities. We are far from the idea of separation. Ugaritic derivatives of the root Kadash designate the very notion of consecration, of belonging. So that's his conclusion from Ugaritic. Now, in chapter 4, he goes on to analyze the derivatives 
in Western texts and inscriptions like Phoenician, for example. And after surveying all of that, he comes up with a synthesis of everything that he's looked at so far. He says, thus we arrive at the doors of the biblical sacred with a positive notion. The meaning of the root, according to W.W. Baudissin and his followers, is fundamentally negative. Baudissin himself was aware of it, especially concerning God. Separation implies a withdrawal, whereas consecration requires an advance. I devote myself to divinity by dedicating to it the object of my consecration. Now, at this point, it would be good to stop for a moment and just talk about what consecration means in English. So, the dictionary I have in front of me says, a solemn commitment of your life or your time to some cherished purpose, to a service or a goal. So, there's that connotation we have in English of consecration. I'm not sure all of the connotations it has in French. So, to continue with what Costa Calda says, he says, in non-biblical Semitic texts, To consecrate oneself is not to separate, but to approach. The consecration is the opposite of the separation. Then he says, We can already imagine the possible consequences of this positivity in the ritual and ethical biblical texts in which the root derivatives kadash appear. The authors of the biblical writings will resume and use the derivatives of the root kadash. They had as their only linguistic tool the language of Canaan. It remains to be ascertained whether they have profoundly modified the meaning of these derivatives and whether they have thus given to the sacred one or more specific senses. It was valuable to show that they already had a precise vocabulary with positive connotations. So that's his conclusion there of part one. Now in part two, He analyzes all the contexts of the use of Kadash in the Bible. Now, before we look at some of his examples, I want to jump back and ask the question, what about our lexicons? So, for example, Liddell Scott, the Greek lexicon for the word hagios in Greek for holy. What's the basic meaning there? Well, It actually says the fundamental meaning is devoted to the gods. So not separate from the gods, but devoted to the gods. Now, at this point, I want to be clear that what I'm going to talk about mainly has to do with wholly referring to persons, not things or objects. So the purpose here is to explore how holy should be understood when applied to people. So it's it's common for a word to carry a different meaning, a range of meaning, and a different meaning when applied to a human being than when applied to a thing. So in English, for example, a person can be tender. In a way, a steak cannot be tender, right? So context is king here. And this is what uh, Costa Calda was getting at. He was trying to say, hey, look, we can't just rely on etymology We have to look at all of the contexts and understand the word from its contexts. So that's what I want to do in this podcast is look at the context, reevaluate how it's being used in context. Also, I want to make sure everyone understands that the semantic range of a word is not permanently fixed and may shift considerably over time. So I'm not going to tell you that a word has always meant the same thing over centuries, okay? Because we all know that that doesn't work. Sometimes a word does retain its meaning for centuries, and sometimes it absolutely does not. So it'd be, it would be linguistically disingenuous to say that a word always means such and such. Uh, as Nida explains, a word's meaning is a set of relations for which a verbal symbol is a sign. Words are not infinitely malleable, but they are also not completely static or inextricably bound by their root or history. So, in this discussion, 
we acknowledge that holy may connote other things such as purity, depending on the context. So uh, this is just a simple beginning to a discussion, and I hope it helps stir up others to further development of the idea. Now, let's look at Psalm 22. Let's get into context, shall we? David begins by crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? His experience has been that of a child who knows that his father loves him, but seems to be acting contrary to that devotion to his well-being. Then, in the contrasting assertion that follows, he shifts his mind from the present suffering to the overarching reality of God's character. Okay? So this is what he he says. He argues with God, presenting God's holiness as his first reason why God should not leave him without an answer or salvation. So he says, yet you are holy, verse 3. So why have you forsaken me? Yet you are holy, right? So in the verses that follow, he expounds what he has in mind with, with holiness. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame, verse 4. So once again, David refers to the holiness of God in Psalm 30. In verse 4, he says, Sing to Yahweh, O you his saints, and give thanks at the memory of his holiness, or the remembrance of his holiness. The ground clause, signaled by key in Hebrew, for giving thanks for his holiness, comes next. In the next verse, which sheds light on the meaning of the word, right? So if you're if you're you're praising God and you're invoking the remembrance of his holiness, and then you say for dot dot dot, you're going to describe what that holiness looks like. So here's what he says. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. The fact that God's favor lasts a lifetime does not coincide with the idea of separateness, nor of infinite moral purity or transcendence as it is typically perceived. So why would David want to highlight the favor or goodwill of God as a reason to exalt his separateness or transcendence? It simply doesn't make sense. God's favor is something active and positive that demonstrates the devotion of God to his people. So David is equating holiness in some way with favor, all right, or goodwill, ratzon in Hebrew. And so let's look a little bit at how this is used in different contexts. Isaiah, ratzon involves showing compassion in Isaiah 60 verse 10. And in Psalm 5, verse 12, God surrounds righteous people with favor as with a shield. David says later on within Psalm 30 that God, by his favor, has made his mountain stand strong. Once more, David asks God to do good to Zion by his favor. Psalm 51, 18. ESV says, in your good pleasure. So, if showing favor is a result of God being holy, the holiness of God is more likely to be defined by an active and zealous disposition of goodness toward his people rather than separateness, purity, or transcendence. Now, once this basic understanding of God's holiness is established, verses like Psalm 71, 22 begin to make more sense, wherein the psalmist chooses to refer to God as the Holy One of Israel, in parallel with praise for his faithfulness. So here's what he says. I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. 
And my tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long, for they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. Now, earlier the psalmist prays, Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Yahweh, from my youth. So this desire for God's salvation and trust that he will save and has in the past marks the central thematic element of the psalm. Therefore, surely, surely, the psalmist would address God by a name that predicates his commitment and dedication to his people rather than an unexpected name that conjures up God's abstract transcendence, right? As you probably already know, the naming of God is not arbitrary in Scripture. So Hagar, Hagar, she demonstrates this intuition to name or refer to God according to the context of the situation, highlighting one of his attributes that applies to the present need. Okay, so after the angel of Yahweh tells her about the son she will bear, we read, So she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. Ata el roi. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. And that's in Genesis 16, 13, and 14. So in the case of lonely, despised, used Hagar, she needed a God who would look after her who would pay attention to her in spite of being unworthy of such divine care. So all that to show that people often call upon God's name and name God, call him by a name that fits the context, that makes sense in their time of need. Anyway, that's all for today. Next time, we're going to look at a whole lot more biblical texts, contexts, to see how this plays out and what we can learn from it. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss those. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all treasure the Bible more and go deeper into it and ultimately become more like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.